Cool. Okay. Um, so, welcome. Uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, so, the title obviously is How to Live Well to 100, which is quite a broad uh, and pretty bold statement to make, because if, if we knew the answer to that, everyone would live to 100. Um, but I'll talk you through some of the interesting areas around it. Um, so, as Harry said, my name's Dane, uh, and the plan today is to give you a little bit of an OV. So, we're going to talk a little bit about mortality versus morbidity. So, um, what do you die from early versus what do you live with? It's a long-term condition. And how can we improve those, both prevent you getting them, but also if you get them, to help you live better. Um, and then using that, we'll break down into lifestyle factors, so things that might change or that you could influence today that might make a difference, so both to your employees, but also to yourself. Uh, and then finally, we'll have a look around inactivity, which is one of our big risk factors and one of the ones we've been talking about before. And then finally, I want to talk about what that all leads to. And then ultimately, even if you know this is all right, how do you change your employee? How do you change someone in your workplace and make a difference? Because that's a challenge. We all know we should stop smoking, but how do we get the person to do that, for example? So we'll talk through a little bit about that as well. And um, before I get started, I'll just give you a background to myself, uh, just so you got an overview. Uh, so I was one of Harry's lecturers. Um, I take that as a plus point, I guess. Um, so, um, my, my role with Champion Health is as medical advisor. Uh, my other jobs, I have a portfolio career, I think is, is what most people call this. So I'm a GP by trade, so working at the Haxby Group in York. Um, but then I'm also a sport and exercise medicine doctor, which is sports speciality. So there's only nine of us every year in the country recruited by the NHS. Um, so 14 years of training in total by the time I finish. Um, and then the rest of my time is spent doing a range of physical activity work. So for Royal College of GPs, Public Health England. Um, and then teaching a lot. Uh, and then uh, for my sins, I look after, if you follow any local sport, York City Football Club and York City Knights. Um, and then I do some work with England football uh, and with GB basketball as well. So a um, bit of a portfolio career, but my interest has always been exercise uh, and lifestyle. Uh, and my background before medicine was as a personal trainer, working in exercise referral services. Um, and I still teach a few classes now and again, uh, although it is getting harder to squeeze it all in. Okay, so um, I guess the first question is how do you live well to 100 means um, what are the risk factors that we want to look at because we can't influence everything. So when we talk about mortality, it's what do people die from early and then morbidity is what conditions do we have that takes a while and, and is kind of an issue to us that we might be able to prevent or live better with or stop them getting worse. So I want to show you some of the UK data. So this is females. Um, this is looking at cause of death in the UK. So I'll point this out to you. So this is age by category. Um, and then along here, you've got the, the main cause, the second cause, the third cause, the fourth cause. Does that make sense? So if you have a look along, you can see here. So if we look at our working age population, so let's say we start at 20, then actually suicide is, is fairly high. So if we look at that, that's mental health. So as it's female, as you go down the list, then breast cancer becomes the next number one. And then if you move across, so we've got suicide, breast cancer, and then you start to hit the early 50s and we start to get heart disease coming in kind of late 30s to early 50s there. And can you see how they shift with time and age and risk factors, which I think is quite interesting. Um, so breast cancer obviously being a major part as well, and we'll come back to risk factors for that too. So that's female. And this is male. So male slightly different, but still common theme here, suicide, mental health, fairly high up. So these are things that are very much preventable. You know, people shouldn't be dying in the UK with this, with especially the level of healthcare we have, the level of support and the skills that people have in the UK. So this is a big issue for us. Um, then heart disease for males comes up earlier than in females because females are more protected by that, um, usually till menopause. Um, and then we've got a range of other kind of cancers. But the main ones I want to point out to you is the mental health stuff and the heart disease. Does that seem familiar or look like it's possible in terms of things you've come across yourselves? Yeah, so these are big issues to us and I guess ultimately for us the, the question is well how can we stop these things happening? Um, so what are the risk factors um, to have these problems? How can we identify them and what can we do about them? Um, and I guess whether you're an employer and you're looking after employees and you know that this is a high risk, how can we identify this early and what can we put in place? To show you another way of looking at it, this is the WHO, so World Health Organization's uh, top five non-communicable disease risk factors for mortality. So basically, what can you die from as a risk factor that isn't catchable? Um, so our top five are here. So high blood pressure makes sense because if you look at the whole population as an average, not by age, 
the biggest cause of death is cardiovascular disease, so heart disease. Um, so high blood pressure is your main risk factor. So high blood pressure is always number one. That's why GPs love to measure blood pressure anytime you're in. It doesn't matter what it is, we want to know. Because even if you feel fine, it's a big risk factor, it's a big cause of death, and actually we can do something about it quite quickly. So high blood pressure is always number one. Tobacco number two is still a problem. What was the biggest thing we did to uh, stop smoking in the UK? Yeah, took it out of pubs. Yeah, we had the smoking ban. We forced it into play and, and made people change their behaviour. So smoking has gone down, but it's still a big issue. And we've still got a large cohort of people who are probably the old generation who are so addicted to smoking that whatever we do, there's going to be a large amount that are. But we've definitely got a new generation of people who don't smoke or who now see e-cigarettes or other things as an option um, that actually is still probably easier to change their behaviour. So what can we do there in the workplace to encourage that? High blood glucose, so we're talking about diabetes, but also have you come across pre-diabetes? Yep, so pre-diabetes is a concept of abnormal glucose in the blood, um, but it's not quite diabetes, and what can we do about that? And actually, that's the best time. If we can pick that up there, we can change it. And one of the most exciting things about diabetes is there's been loads of studies now, including Newcastle studies, saying you can put type 2 diabetes into remission. So we know it's possible. The challenge is how do you get your employee to do that who's at risk or already diabetic? Uh, and we'll talk about some of the things we could do. Um, physical inactivity is a big part, so my role with Public Health England, a lot of what we're doing now is teaching uh, doctors and allied health professionals uh, more about physical activity, so they'll give that advice, because at the moment there's a habit of handing out a prescription, but probably the lifestyle stuff to go with it is probably lacking in our medical sector, which uh, some of you guys in the sectors you work in probably do far better, so that's something we're working on. And then overweight and obesity is there, but the key thing to point out here is overweight and obesity is an independent risk factor to physical inactivity. They're not hand in hand. Does that make sense? So you can be physically active and obese, in which case you're still doing some good and they're very separate things. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to show you some corporate kind of wellness data. So it's taken off public health and website, so all or reasonably trustworthy sources. I'm gonna pick out some of the key stats to you. So I think the first thing to point out is one in four employees have a physical health condition, which is actually quite a lot, uh, of which one in five of these employees with a physical health condition also have a mental health condition. And if you have a physical health condition, you're more likely to have a mental health condition as well. So that's also worth bearing in mind. So if you know someone has a physical health condition but they don't have a mental health condition they've told you about, well, actually, they're still higher risk, so what can we do there? How do we screen for that, and how do we pick that up? Okay. Um, so there's a range of things here, and the ones I want to pick out to you is, is this stat here. So one in eight current employees have a mental health condition. So again, a reasonably high number. And one in ten have a musculoskeletal condition. I'll come back to that. So these are all things that are going to affect people working productively uh, and also going to account towards sick days, which we'll talk about the stats in a second. So in terms of sick days, I just want to point these ones out to you. So these were the main cause of sick days, taken from a 2013 data, just because it takes a while by the time you analyse it. But if you look at this, then musculoskeletal conditions actually accounted for the most. Minor illnesses, not a lot you can do about coughs and colds to some extent. There are things you can do in terms of lifestyle to reduce your risk of getting it and improve your immune system, so we could look at that. Um, but ultimately, mental health comes in again. But we're talking millions of days here, aren't we? Yeah, so 46 million days just between MSK and mental health. So a massive amount. This is quite an interesting one, the cost of uh, presenteeism, which is the concept that you turn up to work but you're ill. Which is actually, you know, we, we push people to turn up to work, which is fine. But actually, if they turn up to work but they're not productive, um, or they're not as productive as it could be, then actually that's a loss in income. Uh, and they estimate that's about 30 billion annually. So it's not just not turning up to work, it's turning up to work unwell or not being fully fit to perform the function that you want to do. So I guess some of our challenge is not just going to a HR department or somewhere else and saying, well, how many days have you lost? It's how many days are good quality days that you would go, this was good work and they weren't um, hindered by something else entirely. Okay, so large amounts of money going through here. And this is one of the PHE stats around. Employers spend nine billion each year on sick pay and associated costs. These are massive numbers. So... And I think what we're hopefully going to show you is uh, different ideas and different ways you can do that. Some will be things you can do yourself, and others might be things where you may need some support or help. Okay. So, 
If we have a look at claims, so um, one of our jobs as a GP is, I guess, to sign off people for sick days, um, which is always a difficult task, especially when you think about the fact that a lot of it is mental health related. How do you prove someone has truly got stress in the workplace? It's really hard to, and you kind of have to take someone's word for it. But I think the majority of people, in most cases, we undervalue it and probably say, no, that person's fine, when actually they're probably not. And actually, it's how do we screen that? How do we pick it up? And how can we support them to stop them losing these days? So it's 48%, which is a large amount, is just mental health related, um, which is massive. MSK comes in second, so you think about a working population, particularly they're younger, they might be more active, or they, and again, MSK becomes more of an issue. Also, as we live longer and as we work later, osteoarthritis and other conditions are also going to cause more MSK problems. Also, just like you guys are sitting today, sedentary jobs do that too, don't they? Uh, and GPs are no different. I don't know about your GP surgery. Uh, at the ones I've worked at in the past, sometimes we have a tannoy system, so we can sit for four hours and just press the buzzer and get people to come in, which means actually we're also just sitting still the whole time. So um, there's some interesting studies to talk about it later. How can we get employees moving more? It doesn't mean that they have to stand all the time, but they need to break up that sitting somehow because eight hours spent doing admin or some other task on a computer is, is difficult. Okay. So I'll leave that with you. The last bits to point out, maybe less of an issue, but actually cardiovascular is still coming up there. And by cardiovascular, that's all your risk factors go with it. So does this person have high levels of stress, which still come under that? Do they, have they got high blood pressure? What's their cholesterol like? All the things that you could find out today, but would be a ticking time bomb for maybe a decade's time or 20 years time. And I think the biggest issue with lifestyle medicine now is how do we find the people who are at high risk now and really do something about it today versus wait till they get their disease and then put them on a tablet? Well, sometimes doctors make mistakes. Anna, you need to try twice as hard to fix them. Are you using your inhaler? All the time. Go through one a week. You sure you're using it right? Do I look like an idiot? Nope. Why don't you show me how your inhaler works? So while I'm say, not saying that all patients and employees don't know what they're doing around health, I think we shouldn't assume they know what they're doing about their health. And this is the same for a patient uh, or an employee. So we might assume that they know how to eat well, that they know how to manage their lifestyle, to sleep, all the other things that we think are important. But actually, how do you know they know? Does that make sense? So how do we find that information out? How do we screen for it? And then how do we put things in place? Uh, and I guess this is what I think I like about this video is the fact that in medicine we make this assumption all the time. Here's your new inhaler, crack on with it. No one really checks, can you use it properly? And then they come back with an asthma attack and you're like, oh, okay, no one told you how to use your inhaler. And I think it's the same thing here. If you come in with new diabetes or stress or actually have we taught employees how to manage stress and workload, when to ask for help? Have we told them how to reduce their risk factors? And I guess that's a critical part of what uh, we want to do in the workplace really. Okay, lifestyle, there's loads of lifestyle factors we can look at and obviously in, in a 45 minute type uh, talk that we're doing today, it's about highlighting key bits. Um, one of the stats I wanna pick out, mental health has come up over and over again and is quite a large issue. So I'll show you this, see what you think. But um, this, is, this is some of the key stats I wanted to point out. So one in six people of working age have a diagnosable mental health issue. And this is the number of days that were lost, 15 million days just down to stress, depression, anxiety. It's really common issues that we see day to day. But actually, the more important thing is, a lot of these are work-related. So the stat below is that most of these things are work-related. So actually, we know that some of these people are gonna have triggers for stress at work. How do we identify that early and what do we do about it? But also, it comes up with another interesting thought, which is how do we recruit people in general? Do we recruit them with the right behaviors and skills that they will be able to cope with that stress? Um, because it's not just about their CV. Do they have the ability to cope? And if not, they're not the right person for the task, and that has to be considered. So who's the right person for the right role, and do they have the skills to do it? And it's not just about the ability to do a job, it's about resilience. Do they have those skills? Uh, and I think sometimes we don't really check that. Um, I think medicine is, is as much at fault to that. You get loads of junior doctors, you finish your five years, you're picked based on your, basically what your grades were, weren't you? And if you've got a round curriculum, 
No one actually says, can you cope with stress? How are you good under pressure? Till your first day when you get a cardiac arrest and suddenly there's loads of people on stress, on leave, uh, seeking help because actually they weren't equipped to cope with that. Um, and I guess the same in, in any corporate workplace. There are people giving talks all the time who might not be up for it. There might be people dealing with a large amount of staff who are difficult to manage. There might be time pressures. Has that person got the skills or have you given them the skills to manage that, I guess, is a question. So 19% of long-term sickness absence is in, uh, attributed to mental health, which is large. <coughs> so just some thoughts. If you look at the research, so most of it is interview-based research, so qualitative research. Um, a lot of what makes someone happy in the workplace or in terms of mental health is around job control. Do they have control of what they're doing or are they just pushed around by someone else? Do they have some autonomy, some control to make it their own? Because if you have some autonomy or some control yourself, you're more likely to be fulfilled and you're more likely to do things in a direction that, that you feel is necessary. Whereas if you're constantly working for the man who gives you no space, then you're less likely to find that. Satisfaction, are you satisfied in your job? So when we do appraisals a lot of the time, do you, a lot of you guys do appraisals in your jobs? Yeah, a lot of time we do appraisals. So medicine, we do it uh, a lot. Um, so I have to log a certain number of hours and reflect every year in order to be allowed to practice the next year but no one ever asked me if I'm satisfied in my job and what would I really truly like to do next year and actually is it the same job now or actually is this something I'm aiming for because if you do know that that helps someone to feel satisfied no one wants to be in the same job for their whole career very few people do and most people leave not necessarily because they didn't like the employer but sometimes because their job hasn't changed at all so I guess you know how do we do that and fit that into appraisal I think is is a good way to look at it. So have a look at appraisal design and see what you think. Um, is your job fair? Um, a classic example of that is um, you've got a 40 hour contract, but you seem to be working 80 hours um, and your employer thinks it's normal. It's the culture. It's in many jobs, isn't it? I used to think it's just in medicine, but actually talking to a lot of corporate people, it's the same wherever you go. Um, my brother-in-law has just quit medicine uh, and joined um, a large kind of consultancy firm and has just left medicine behind. And he thought the grass was greener when he left. Um, but he's actually doing about 100 hours now versus the 80 that he was for. And it's still a 40-hour contract. So I think it's rife in lots of um, professions now. But our challenge is how do we challenge that and make it realistic? Because these guys burn out um, and they don't become productive. Um, so how do we make the job fair? What's reasonable? And there are lots of things these days, especially with tech, that we can automate. So, you know, how can we use tech better to reduce workload? And then I think this is a key one, sense of community. If you've got a sense of community, you're more likely statistically to stay in your job, you're more likely to feel fulfilled, and you're less likely to leave. So I guess an interesting thing is how do you create that sense of community in your workplace? How do you create that social culture without obviously it, um, taking an impact on your actual outcomes? How many of you have got open offices out of curiosity? Um, it's the new in thing, isn't it? But uh, interestingly, uh, if you look at productivity, apparently productivity is lower in an open office, which I think is interesting, but it looks cool and it is nice and you can go and socialise and probably network better to get certain tasks done. But I wonder if that's, you know, I wonder if there's still a role for it in terms of community, but maybe less in productivity. So where's the balance maybe? So that was mental health, and I think mental health is key. The second one I wanted to talk to you about is around obesity. So obesity is a big risk factor for many things. Um, so obesity is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, um, but it's also a risk factor for cancer. I don't know how many of you have seen the Cancer Research UK stuff out there. There was lots of adverts around obesity, um, which were some people thought were controversial. There was a lot of stuff in the press around, well, fat people don't, you know, it, you didn't get cancer because you were fat was the kind of Daily Mail conversation, wasn't it, if you saw it. Um, but actually, obesity does cause cancer, but it doesn't cause all cancers, but it's a risk factor. And we have to acknowledge that and look at what we can do. Um, so I think there's a couple of things to mention. One is the average person in the workplace sees the person that is overweight. You can pick them out to some extent, can't you? And you can say, okay, this person we could do something about. But actually, I think the more interesting thing is, what about the people of normal weight? We, we're really bad at this in the NHS as well. If you're normal looking, normal weight, normal BMI, then what do we do? We tell you you're okay, that you're healthy. We make that assumption based purely on weight. 
So there is the counterbalance. So this is an MRI spectroscopy. So two people here have the same BMI. So that means they've got, for, the, for height and weight, they're roughly the same. You happy with me with BMI? So 25 and above is overweight. So you basically take your height and a weight into a formula. 25 and above is overweight-ish. 30 and above is obese. 20, 25-ish is, is kind of our norm, isn't it? And that's what we're aiming for. Um, interestingly, different ethnic minorities will need different weights, uh, weight ranges because, for example, if you are lucky like me to be Southeast Asian, then your risk of diabetes and heart disease is uh, significantly higher. So therefore, actually, I need to aim for a lower BMI to make my risk lower uh, or bring it back to the same as the rest of the population. So BMI really critical for these things. This shows two BMIs exactly the same. Who is healthier, left or right? Yeah, so healthier, probably right, definitely. Yeah, so the guy on the left has got a load of fat, so the white stuff that you see around his organs. Can you see that? Yes, yeah, so that's your intra-abdominal adipose tissue. <coughs> he also has lipids or fats inside his liver as well and in his muscles. They all put him at higher risk of cardiometabolic disease. This is heart disease, diabetes and so on. High blood pressure, all of the rest. The guy on the right has got most of his in his subcutaneous tissue, so under his skin. Um, we know that subcutaneous fat is protective. So if you just, if you were overweight in terms of weight and number, but your fat was purely under your skin and nowhere else, then actually you would be protected against many diseases, not the other way around. So distribution of fat is, is key. Um, and actually in the NHS, we can't afford to do MRI spectroscopies on people. I think it's seven, 800 pound a pop. It's not gonna happen. Um, if you're a billionaire and you want to live to 100, I mean, for sure, you'd get an MRI spectroscopy done uh, along with a range of other tests. Um, and interesting, there's some place in London that do exactly that for billionaires, which is how do you make this guy live to 100? And they optimise every single aspect. For us, for the average person, that's not realistic. But actually, how do we find this person who is normal looking, but actually has a high amount of fat? Well, this high intra-abdominal adipose tissue is most sensitive to physical activity. So the more active you are, the earlier you'll burn this. So I have a lot of patients who tell me, that I tell them to be physically active, and they come back and say they've been active, they've changed their diet, but they haven't lost enough weight yet. And I try and reassure them and say, if they've been more active, they're gonna be less like the guy on the left and more like the guy on the right. So even though they can't see it, there is a change happening that will be um, positive, but it might take 10, 20 years before they might really see that they didn't get that disease. Does that make sense? So it's, it's about trying to get across why is this important. So uh, this paper is by a guy called Thomas. He coins the phrase toffees. So we're missing these toffees. They're thin on the outside, fat on the inside. How do we pick them up? Um, and so he has a range of different ways of, of doing that. But one of the main ones he says is, if they're overweight, then you know what you're gonna do. You're gonna provide an intervention. If they're normal weight, are you gonna ask a second question? And could that second question be, how much physical activity do you do and how much do you do? And actually, if it isn't enough, then they're likely to be this guy on the left and we need to give them some more advice. Yeah. And if they're not and they do enough, then they're likely to be on the guy on the right and we can relax. Yeah. Happy, happy with that as a concept? Okay. Um, alcohol, beer, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I think there's two, two things to look at. One is hydration status in general in employees. So some employees uh, particularly don't drink all day particularly if you're working them hard. So how do we encourage them to drink regularly? What does that look like? Um, because actually that is still important towards energy levels um, and towards a range of other health conditions. And I'll talk to you about that in a bit. So hydration is one thing. The other thing is alcohol in general. In the UK, we do have an alcohol problem to some extent. Most people drink more than the government recommended guidelines, don't they? Which means our risk of, of certain diseases do go up. Um, and that's common, we see it in general practice all the time. We ask someone, how much do you drink? And they go, oh, just socially. And then you ask them to quantify it. And it's actually considerably high. Once you add it up, oh, actually it's a bottle of wine most evenings. And suddenly by the time you've added it up, it, it's quite a lot. So again, how can we screen these guys, pick it up early and try and provide input? Um, depending on where you work. So my brother-in-law is my great example at the moment because I'm just watching as his lifestyle changes. He now has more networking meetings, goes out in the evening, has more drinks with, uh, and actually his alcohol intake has, I think, uh, more than tripled, um, which, is, which is understandable given the job he does. 
Um, interestingly, other high stress professions also end up drinking more and medicine is another one of those. Um, so actually, what can we do to find that person early and provide some interventions um, depending on what it is? Sometimes it's just educating people to know they're drinking too much and they didn't even realize they were because it's normal. Um, so it's that culture change, what's normal and how do we change it? If you go into Europe and stuff, people will have a social drink and um, they don't drink to the same level we do socially in the UK. So it's, you know, how do we change that as well? Okay. You guys seen this before? Up, massively up for debate in terms of, especially you going to health and fitness industry, this is very much debated. Is this correct? Um, I think the key thing to get across with this is there is good evidence based for why this plate, so nutrition plate, was designed for the average public. Now, if you're reasonably active, so meeting guidelines and so on and doing the rest, then actually this is an appropriate amount to have for the average person. Now, there are definitely caveats that. There is definitely a lot more evidence coming in around nutrition. So if we look at this here, this is carbohydrates. Happy with that. Um, fruit and veg is there. Then we've got our kind of protein-based stuff down here, and then you've got our dairy down there. And this guide changed, didn't it, um, not that long ago from the food plate. And the idea was to try and be less prescriptive and try and give more advice. But carbohydrates is less now. Um, and there are a lot of people, particularly diabetics now, where the evidence is suggesting even lower levels of carbohydrate. If you're more inactive, then you don't need to fuel your day as much, so actually you could have less. But if you are quite active, like an athlete, you might need more. So there is no hard and fast rule. It's very specific to a person, but I think from a public health viewpoint, it's probably not an unreasonable request. Also, a lot of the people on low-carb diets um, a lot of them are getting good results, not just because they're on low carb diets, but because actually they get a calorie restriction at the same time. Imagine if you don't pile on the pasta on your plate, you suddenly cut down the amount you're eating without even thinking about it. So there's a bit of both. And I think there's a lot of uh, things we don't know yet. And I think this space is the most interesting space in healthcare, constantly looking at how does diet influence disease. Um, probably carbohydrates will go down further over the next few years. Um, so watch this space. But again, do your employees know how to eat? Um, I see a lot of people of working age in general practice setting with constipation, things that you don't come into work and tell your person next to you, oh, it's really hard today. Um, you know, no one's going to say that. But actually, it's an issue. And it also means that if someone is constipated, they can't, most likely, they're not eating the right foods. They probably don't understand the concept of fibre. They probably aren't getting enough fruit and veg. So actually, that is a health time bomb. But actually, when you're younger, the signs might just be constipation because it's going to take another 10, 20, 30 years before all of that starts to impact itself. So again, if we could screen and look at different ways that people are and find out that they are, we can provide advice earlier. Or could this just be an education session to make sure all employees are on the same, on the same starting point? Okay. Before I go back to that, the other thing is canteens and stuff. Do any of you have canteens at work or shop front? I guess also have a look at what do you actually sell in there? What does that look like? And what do you encourage the employee to buy? What's the meal deal look like? You know, is it healthy enough? So that imagine the person that doesn't have the same knowledge as you about nutrition, do you lead them to make a better choice? Or, or is it free for all in which case? I mean, if I've had a stressful day and I come into the canteen, what am I gonna pick? I'm gonna pick pie and chocolate because I feel better. And it, you know, it's comfort food, right? Um, so actually, how do we encourage that? How do we change that? Okay, Sleep's an interesting one. Um, I'm sure many of you have been in the same situation. Uh, my first few years of medicine, I think I probably averaged five, six hours of sleep with shift work and doing a range of other jobs. Um, it just doesn't work. So shift workers are known to die early. That's just a, that's a fact now. There's enough papers out there for that. Um, but people also work long erratic hours or for projects. That's also probably something to consider. If your mind is constantly working, you can't get to sleep and get good quality sleep, then your risk of cardiovascular disease goes up significantly. Um, so we'll come back to the reasons why, but again, there's more stress hormone released. Um, there's less time for um, anti-inflammatory type mechanisms that occur during sleep to happen, which means your risk of cardiovascular death goes up. So six or less hours of sleep, um, a couple of papers suggest somewhere around the 12% mark in terms of increased risk of death. Um, I mean, it's worth sleeping in, isn't it? Um, so um, I guess in a perfect world, how, how do you do that? How do you, make him, how do you make it so you can encourage your employees to sleep better? 
You can't give them all lions till 12 o'clock. It's not realistic because you'll be productive. But at the same time, what tasks are set? How realistic is it? How much of these guys are really working beyond five with you to make this work? Uh, and what other factors will affect sleep? Okay. Any questions so far? If not, I'm going to move on to inactivity. So I've got, I've, uh, I've got two questions where you do have to interact with me a little bit, so I'm hoping you will. Um, but why is inactivity important? Um, this data kind of shows you why, really. So this is prevention of disease. So it's always nice to prevent death. So the um, column on the very right is telling you the strength of the evidence of how good the quality of the research was. And then risk reduction tells you what percentage reduction. And then you've got your diseases. So your risk of death goes down if you are more physically active, which is always useful to know. Um, but then there's a range of other diseases here. So just to pick out some, coronary artery disease or uh, coronary heart disease, depending on what you want to call it, was fairly high up on our list of issues, wasn't it, for an early death? So actually, you can reduce that by nearly a third. So that's massive in itself. We talked about certain cancers, particularly for females, being fairly high up at that earlier age group. Well, actually, there aren't many things you can do to reduce breast cancer um, you know, that are really significant beyond physical activity. And actually, a 20% risk reduction is massive. So again, how can we pick up the employees that have a family history or are more at risk? And could we give them advice? Maybe they're not that bothered about the rest of their health but maybe the way to motivate them is to find out that family history and tell them why it's important. Colon cancer is also there, a little bit further down. Um, and then there's a range of other things. So when we talk about morbidity, so having disease, then Alzheimer's, dementia and stuff comes in later. Less relevant to a working population, but again, hopefully, I guess, if you're in charge of HR, it's not just about keeping people well with you. It's about when they retire, knowing that you've looked after them well and that actually they're going to have a retirement. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of kind of ethics of stuff, I think it's important to look at other things too. Okay. So really important, lots of evidence to say it works. So how do we get people more active? Because it is a problem. This is current UK data for physical activity. Uh, I'll just pick out a couple of them. But nearly half of women don't do enough physical activity for good health. And you've got nearly a quarter of people are physically inactive. So it's less than half an hour in a whole week. So you're talking very low levels of physical activity, which means if we talk back to the amount of prevention you get for disease, that's not great at all. We're a ticking time bomb. Um, and then if you then think about jobs that are now more sedentary, people aren't, it's not just that their work's given physical activity anymore either. So we do have a ticking time bomb and a big issue to change, and I'll come back and show you some of the details for that. Um, another thing to point out, which I think is also worth considering, is think about your workforce, who's there, so LGBT groups, ethnic minorities and females are the hardest to reach and then least active. So again, if your working population has more of any of those groups, then you know, what can you put in place to try and encourage that group more? Uh, and I think it's really important to consider because it can't be a one-size-fits-all model because we know it doesn't work. Um, men, do generally, uh, men generally are more active, but there's still a problem. You know, it's only a third of men, so there's still a problem on both sides. Okay, first question for you, what clock is this? Countdown. Countdown. Point number one, I don't know if Harry's keeping point score, but point number one goes over there. Okay, so tell me what the UK physical activity guidelines are. Get your clock as well. Perfect, 150 minutes a week. Any more for any more? This is more. Perfect, two strength-based exercises. Reduce sedentary time. Any more for any more? 10, steps a day. So 10,000 steps a day might be in it in, in some way, okay? Perfect. Harry's cheating. Uh, 75 minutes of vigorous, very good, okay? Perfect, so that's most of them done. Interesting in a healthcare uh, population group, when you ask this question, it's improving now, but one of our biggest tasks at Public Health England has been uh, upskilling healthcare professionals to know that information, um, which actually most of you smashed out. So um, this is what it is, isn't it? Um, so it's 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity, so that's the kind of activity that gets you slightly out of breath, slightly sweaty. It doesn't need to be more than that, or it could be 75 minutes vigorous or a combination. We know that they need, most studies suggest at least 10 minutes as a block to get a physiological change for benefit, but it depends on the disease that you're trying to improve. Um, for example, high blood pressure, even five minutes of activity is enough to cause a benefit, so it doesn't even have to be a block of 10. Uh, muscle strengthening at least two days a week, which is one of the big ones that I think most people miss. 
Um, so the new government guidelines coming out, or the graphics they're changing, they're trying to push this bit more because it, we're missing it out. Limit time spent sitting is still there. And then I think this is a key one, probably as much for medicine as for you guys. We have a lot of people who get osteopenia, so weaker bones, osteoporosis, but actually they don't get enough um, advice on how to stop falling. We just give them tablets and say, have some calcium, have some vitamin D, that will strengthen your bones. But no one tells you how to stop falling. Surely that's as important as the drugs to, to strengthen your bones. So I think that's why that's there. So these are critical. And I guess our question is for a working age population that you guys are looking after, how many people meet this criteria now? It'd be really interesting to get a baseline in a workplace and go, well, how many of your uh, place is active? And if they're not, then what can we put in place to change that? Okay. Loads of infographics out. Um, initially, this is brought out, uh, so it's the Chief Medical Officer's uh, infographics. You can download them off the Public Health England website. Um, they are being redone at the moment to try and push that resistance training more, so strength-based training more, because um, that's kind of always gets missed a little bit. Okay, this was aimed at healthcare professionals. It was never initially aimed at the public, but I think more public have seen this than healthcare professionals, it's probably fair to say. How many of you guys have seen this before? A few of you? Yeah, great. So um, you can download it. So I have it in my, uh, on the GP room wall. So if a patient's there, they see that and the cancer research poster. And now and again, probably at least once or twice um, a session, someone sparks conversation to talk about it, which I find is, is one way of doing it. There are more infographics, so you've got young people, early years. Um, the other thing to think about for work is, what about pregnancy? How many of your um, employees get pregnant? And of which, what advice do we give them? It shouldn't be a molly coddle them, um, take it really easy. We should be encouraging them to exercise. So there's now infographics and good evidence out there that actually it improves many outcomes. So how do we encourage those people to exercise? Because they might be getting mixed messages from elsewhere. How am I doing for time? Okay. So who gains the most physical activity to us? Just summarise this, wanted to show you this. So y axis shows hazard ratio mortality. So this is basically your risk of dying early. So if you do no exercise, your risk of dying, let's call it one. Now, if you do some physical activity and you increase it, then your risk of dying drops dramatically. As you keep going towards that red line, which is our government guidelines, it keeps dropping. After the government guidelines, though, you can see there is still improvement. So you might ask, well, why is the government guideline there then? It's about being realistic, isn't it, to what the average person will do. There's no point in setting it an hour a day, which is what the evidence says gives you maximal benefits, because the average person is not going to meet it. But actually, even if we get most of the population even halfway, we're going to have most of our results. So actually, it's not about getting everyone to do a triathlon or an Ironman. It's about getting everyone to even get halfway towards this guideline amount. Okay. Um, interestingly, after you start going well beyond an hour a day, the risks start to outweigh the benefits. So there's a range of issues you see in, a, in people who overdo exercise. And it's not just from joint problems. You get a range of uh, heart issues as well. There's a range of other issues to consider. Um, but our main challenge is how do we get employees and other people towards that red line as much as possible? Okay, okay next question for you. What clock is this? It's hard. This one's harder, I think, than the countdown one. Very good. Who was that? Yeah, yeah would he? Okay. Um, so, which of these countries is the least active? Okay, so USA least active. Okay. Which of these countries is the most active? Maybe Australia? Finland? Okay. Any more for any more? Netherlands. Okay. Why Netherlands? Cycling. Okay. So the environment's different in the Netherlands, isn't it? Yeah, the infrastructure's in place, and it's socially acceptable. No one in the Netherlands ever said, did you see that guy who cycled to work today? Whereas we do that in the UK a lot. Do you see that guy in Lycra? Did you see him on his suit? Did you see him come in? Um, also interesting, it depends on your workplace. So um, I worked in uh, York um, and the council offices, and they've got a really interesting setup. So the bikes are parked out the front, you walk through and there are showers and everything to your side and then you come up to the offices. So it's kind of designed to encourage you to come in. Whereas I've worked in another place where I've come on my bike and I'm so sweaty and hot by the end that it's just a pain. And then you're trying to like, get the sweat out of your shirt. It's just, it doesn't work. So in the end, you're like, okay, fine, I'll just drive. So, you know, design is just as important. So Netherlands, yep. Yeah. So you were right. So the answer for WHO, um, 
kind of countries of similar economic uh, status for physical activity levels. So UK was the least active, Netherlands was the most. So remember, this is different to obesity. Um, this is just for activity data. So Netherlands, you're right. Why do you think the UK is, is so poor? Sorry? Weather, yeah, so weather plays a part, yeah. People, there's definitely more activity happening in the summer when people are up for it, and then the winter, everyone's like, oh, I'll wait till, I'll wait till it gets warmer, um, which is an issue to us. And we know that we can't do that because this has to be a regular daily thing to have a health benefit. If we just blocked out in the summer or did a Monday, Friday, chest and back day, that's not enough for health. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'll leave that with you. Um, again, if you go on the Public Health England website, you can see the data around that. This is WHO data. Um, but we are improving this. There's also there's a lifestyle thing. So in America, they actually, when you get the wages, they actually chunk out their fitness training as separate. It's made a priority. In the UK, we don't have that. It's cost us a lot. Right? Yeah. And I think that's where times are changing now. We're starting to recognise that we need to do more. So Public Health England particularly has invested quite a lot of money. The government, if you look to the new NHS kind of white papers, all around prevention, there's definitely more interest in this area. Um, but interesting, there aren't many people who take hold of it and say it's their space. There's one or two people saying it's their space, so now needs someone to take hold of it, take responsibility and move it forward. Um, so in medicine, maybe that's the sport and exercise medicine community because there isn't anything else. But outside of medicine, probably is the physical activity guys and needs someone to take that space on. Okay. MSK wise, this is the other one. So MSK is musculoskeletal conditions. Interesting, how many of you have had a, a bone or joint problem ever okay and then keep your hands up if it's enough to have missed at least a day of work okay so it's a few it's, it's quite common isn't it no one i've really met someone who goes i've never had back pain because if it, there's always someone who puts hand and goes i've never had back pain the average person has felt back pain is that fair to say yeah we all get it um, but actually it's a big issue we get 30.6 million days of sickness absence related to this um, which is nearly what a quarter working day's loss related to MSK, so a big issue. Um, and actually some of it, can, not all of it can be prevented, but some of it can be prevented. Um, and the biggest issues now is it's not just about um, symmetry, uh, as a lot of people used to look at, you know, their, their, their hips out the way or out of alignment. A lot of what we're talking about is, just could posture play a part if you're constantly in a po uh, bad posture? Um, it's not the only cause, but it could be, so particularly your IT setups and everything else. How well are they set up? But it's not just, are they set up well? Do they break up their sitting well? So, you know, how often is it reasonable to get someone to stand up? Don't know if you remember on the old Nintendos, the original Nintendos, they used to have a little warning sign that would tell you that you'd spent too long or something else and tell you to stand and things like that. And you couldn't save your game, so you'd have to give up at some point. But, you know, we don't do that at work, do we? Could we change work so that we tell employees when to break their sitting? Um, there's loads of papers out there for how often we should do that. Some say half an hour, some say an hour. But again, it's then going, well, what, what's that balance with productivity? Because you can't just have them standing up all day. Um, so what's that balance? And also, if someone is starting to get trouble, MSK, the interesting thing with MSK is you, you pick it up early, you can do something about it. If you pick it up too late, it's hard work and it takes months to years to get back. So if you flag up early, there's an issue. What's your intervention? Where are you going to send these people? And what does that look like is important. Okay. Interestingly, uh, the mental health that I, uh, mental musculoskeletal health that I see in the NHS, a lot of it comes together. Uh, a lot of people with back pain that's worse than others, their mental health is also affected. And actually, a lot of time we send them to mental health services as well as sort their back pain, and we need to do both together. So don't ever think of one as on its own. There's usually something else going on. If the person hasn't told you, it doesn't mean it's not there. How do you get that information out of them? And I guess it goes back to good rapport, doesn't it? Being well connected that someone trusts you to tell you. Because a lot of us wouldn't tell our employers um, if we're unwell or if we're really stressed unless we're at breaking point. And usually that's the point at which it's too late. Okay, okay so the key thing I want to talk about here really is that everything we've talked about, all these risk factors, all these lifestyle changes, they're all really important for one thing. So this concept now for the last decade plus has been systemic inflammation. Is this concept you, some of you have come across? Okay, so we think that m a lot of the diseases that I showed you in that table, they occur because of something called systemic inflammation. So your body releases these inflammatory kind of uh, mediators, it's like chemicals, and what they do is they cause damage all over the body. 
And if you've got high levels of this systemic inflammation, then you're more likely to get heart disease, you're more likely to get diabetes, you're more likely to get bone problems, and it might also play a part in mental health too. So what we want to do is dampen down that inflammation. So for example, things like physical activity dampen down the inflammation. A diet that um, is, is healthy, to some extent we need to debate that, um, so cows come home, but lower sugar, better choices, um, all of that will also help with systemic inflammation. Um, stress levels, mental health itself will also play a part into this. So how do we keep this under check? Um, and this is probably a good example of that. So systemic inflammation is, everyone has it, it's normal, um, but how do we keep it in check? So physical activity is key to that, other lifestyle factors are key. Um, also, if you already have a chronic disease in it initially, so all the disease we've been talking about, it can overspill and you get systemic inflammation secondary from another problem. Does that make sense? So the key thing, first of all, how do we prevent chronic disease from even happening? Because once you get one of them, you're more likely to get the others. So systemic inflammation is a big thing. Um, and if you're interested uh, through Harry, um, I can send around some papers uh, if, if someone is interested and read more about it. Um, but that's our big push. How do we dampen that down? And we don't know completely what will help on that. Interestingly, pharmacology or pharma companies, what do you think they're looking at? They're looking at, can we produce a pill to reduce inflammation systemically? Which is possible, but actually it shouldn't be at the, at the detriment of doing basics like eating better and doing physical activity. So how do we change behavior? So you've, you've kind of picked up these risk factors. You know what we need to do and you know what's an issue. But actually, how do we get your employee to make the changes. So first of all, we've got to screen it and work out that they need to be changed. And depending on how big your company is, how are you gonna realistically screen that many people? What are you gonna screen them for? And then what are you gonna do that information? If you've then decided that you have the information, you then need to work out which bits are worth changing. So for example, if you smoke, if you eat poorly and you're inactive, then how do you decide which one to start on? Because you can't start on all three. Um, I used to think it was which is the most important for health, but I now go with which is the most important to change behaviour. So if someone is more likely to understand that their diet is poor and wanting to change that, then let's change that. Start with the thing that is the lowest hanging fruit that they're e most likely to do. If they have a good outcome, they're able to change it and they get a positive response, and they're more likely to start to change the other things. So I think sometimes you have to be pragmatic and not just say, well, academically we should do this. It's what's realistic to that person. So what motivates that person? Is it because there's a family history of breast cancer? Uh, or, you know, is it health? Or actually, is it aesthetics? And that's fine if that is the honest reason why they want to change. We use whatever it is that motivates them to make that change. Most of you guys have seen this before. So this is a Prochaska di Clemente model of uh, change. And I think the most interesting thing with this is, let's say you flag up that someone is more stressed or they don't eat well or they're physically inactive and you want to talk to them about it. So at this point, they haven't really thought about it. Maybe the first time you flagged it up is now. There is no way, or it's very unlikely, that a 10 minute conversation is gonna get them from here to doing something about it immediately and changing their life. It's not going, it's unlikely to happen to the bulk of people. We need to do more, we need to give them information um, we need to get them to think about it. We need to make them come up with their own solutions. And usually uh, people who are good at this stuff do it by a way of motivational interviewing, don't they? So they try and change behavior. Um, so guys like Harry and Jenna are back, their masters are in physical activity in that area. And that's kind of their expertise is how to change people's behavior, which I think is really important because especially in a, in a clinical setting in 10 minutes, I know someone's got a problem, but to actually change their behavior takes a lot longer than 10 minutes. And even if I tell them to change, they're probably not. They need further input from somewhere. Okay. So I guess this is, this is our challenge. How do we get these people here? What can we put in place? It's scalable as well. So I want to show you this model, uh, and then I'm going to show you uh, for each risk factor we talked about. Um, I really like this model. Um, there are lots of things out there. This is an intervention ladder. So it's a Nuffield Council Bioethics Ladder of Intervention. So you've got three things. You've got nudges, shoves, and smacks. So Imagine that you were a parent, um, this is very non-politically correct, but just take it with the humor that it's uh, dealt with, uh, don't take it too firstly. So imagine you're the population, uh, no, so sack that, you are the government, so you are the parent. Imagine the kids are the population, okay? So let's say it's for smoking. 
So initially you want to make sure your kids don't smoke. Well, what do you do? Initially, if it's modern parenting, you might just simply do nothing and monitor, right? So we just watch the population. Do they smoke? What happens? What's going on? Let's say that's not really working and you think there's more going on. Um, then what could you do? Well, you can inform them and educate them. You could show them black lungs. You could tell them it's bad, all of those things, okay? So if that works, then great. But as we all know, that never worked in the 90s, did it? We had loads of that. Most of us who went to school in that age group, there were tons of black lungs being shown, people still smoking. So then what do you do? The go you're the government. You try doing little nudges. You've tried educating and making people make a better choice, and people aren't doing it. So what do you do next? You could have shoved them or, or gently pushed them, is probably a better word, in the direction you want them to take. So you could do this by uh, incentivizing them, or you make that financial or otherwise. So, for example, our shoves might be, well, let's get rid of adverts. Let's get rid of adverts in magazines so people aren't seeing it more likely to get it. Let's increase the price of it. Let's add taxes to it. Let's make it so you can't buy a small number of cigarettes. You've got to buy a big box, which means your social smokers are less likely to buy. Does that make sense? We're trying to make them do something. And then if that doesn't work and you're the government and you're now scratching your head, you spent billions of pounds trying to make people stop. They don't listen to black lungs on boxes. It, uh, the cigarette sticks say it will kill you and people are like, okay, great. And the price has gone up. I'm still buying it. Then what do you do? You've got to smack your population. You've got to take the decision out of their hands. So our classic smack was the smoking ban, as you, as you all well know. And the smoking ban has made a big difference, hasn't it? But if you ask someone um, 50 years ago, um, that you won't be allowed to smoke in pubs, it would have been socially unacceptable. People would have said, no, it's a classic staple part of British culture, isn't it? You have a fag with your pint. It's a standard place to go. Where, so actually, it's taken someone to legislate it to change that behaviour. So the interesting question I ask you here is, if we talk about risk factors, what can we do for all the risk factors we talked about? So we've talked about diet. So for an employee perspective, how can you nudge an employee? How can you shove an employee? And what could a smack look like? So you could do it for diet, you could do it for physical activity, you could do it for stress management, you could do it for a range of things. So I'm gonna kind of go through some of my thoughts on that and see what you guys think. But ultimately my biggest takeaway is work out what risk factors you wanna change in your workplace, how are you gonna find out what those are, and then which of these nudges, shoves or smacks could you put in place? Obviously don't go straight to a smack. Um, start slow uh, and work your way up. So, before I show you those examples, do I want to ask you a question? I've gone all out here, so I hope you appreciate that. There are no lifelines left before some smart ass asks me for one. Okay, so I'll give you my good Chris Tarrant voice. How many patients need to be given physical activity advice to change at least one patient from inactive to active? You're going to stand up for the answer you think it is. I'm going to go in order. So if you think it's four patients that need to be given physical activity advice to change at least one patient from inactive to active, Please stand up. Okay, no one for A. Okay, if you think the answer is eight for B, please stand up. Okay, if you think the answer is C, 12, please stand up. Okay, if you think the answer is D, 16, please stand up. Okay. Um, so for the guys who hit C, you are correct. Uh, the answer is C. Um, that also goes with my strategy for all multiple choice exams, which is the answer is always C, okay? Um, so it's 12. And interestingly, it's 12. Smoking is 20. So you need to roughly give 20 people advice to get one person to go from smoking to not smoking. So bang for buck, physical activity advice and intervention is also pretty useful. So let's talk about these risk factors to finish off if you're happy. So um, I've just taken each of our champion health icons and I'm going to go through some of the ideas around them. Um, and be interesting, please do shout out and tell me if you have your own. So nutrition-wise, um, these were my thoughts. Um, and I'm not sure what you think. So nudges, I thought, well, could we educate people? Because we don't know what people's education are in a, in a workplace setting. So could that be a seminar? Could that be a lecture? Could it be some e-learning? Could it be a poster? Could it be something where you educate them? Could just be signs in the canteen. Could be little signs that just make you make a better choice. Could be using the traffic light system, whatever you want to educate. So that could be your nudge. Now let's say that doesn't work, then you could start to shove them down the direction you want. Maybe you make healthier food cheaper or put it on offer with a discount. Maybe you increase the price of confectionery instead, um, which gives you a larger profit margin so no one's gonna complain. Um, 
or maybe look at positioning. Maybe it's really hard to get to their poor choices. Does that make sense? So how do you channel, how do we influence those people coming through your door without them realizing we're influencing them to some extent? And let's say that doesn't work, how do we smack them um, without losing your job? So you're gonna do that by, maybe it's ban all unhealthy food. The challenge is, it's not like smoking where it's black and white. What's unhealthy to one person is not necessarily unhealthy to another, and it depends on proportion. But you could maybe ban really obvious things. Um, now, some things just won't be acceptable. Your workplace might say, this isn't acceptable to us, and it might just kick off and not be a good idea at all. So you have to consider what's acceptable in your workplace. Any other thoughts on this? Ban vending machines. Sorry? Ban vending machines. Ban vending machines, yeah, definitely. So that could easily be uh, um, done. So for example, in the hospitals, classic example, that hospitals have vending machines everywhere, and everyone's a shift worker, and when they're hungry, the canteen is shut. So where do you go? Um, and now that actually before it used to be difficult because you needed change to get into the machine now you don't even need change you just use your contactless card so you, you can buy all day long um, so actually that's an issue so we need to change that so either ban vending machines or change what goes in a vending machine yep Definitely. okay so just to get you think about that have a think when you go back about what you might work in your workplace okay so cardiac wise I've kind of bolted in all the kind of risk factors around cardiac health so Again, nudges is always around education, informing, allowing someone to make their own decisions. So again, can you make heart healthy foods more obvious maybe? Or if they're staircases, can you put signs next to the staircase telling them how, why it's good for them? And signs on the lift saying, you know, do you have a good reason to use this lift? Um, that kind of concept. Um, there's a there's concept now where people are saying, well, should we just be telling people that unless you have a good disability or reason for using the lift, then actually you shouldn't be that it's almost disability access. So whether you're arthritis, something else where you have to use it versus someone who just use it for the sake of using it. Has anyone been to Hull Royal? So Hull Royal is a really interesting hostel in the sense it's got 15 or 17 floors to it, a few lifts at the bottom. People wait half an hour for a lift to go up to the second floor sometimes um, when they could just walk. But there's nothing to encourage them to walk either and people just follow the other people to stand by the lift. Does that make sense? So it goes back to design. How can we make it more encouraging to take the stairs? So that would be part of our, sh uh, that would even lead from nudges to shoves to some extent. Also design of the building. Can you change the design of the building or add little things that make it easier for someone to commute to work and encourage them? As a GP practice in Sheffield that went the whole hog, they, um, they got electric bikes in um, because there are loads of hills, but they still own cycle and other bikes in for them. They bought two small cars so that people could commute to work but still have a car for home visits. And they would tell them mile radius, so if your home visit was nearby, you could use the bike. Um, and actually, a lot more people are active. And more to the point, other people, patients seeing them being active, which is more encouraging. So it's all the little, sometimes they're gimmicky, but actually people see that, and it's good for PR for a company, but also starts to get people talking about why these things are important, which then leads back to education. And then finally, smacks. What could a smack be? Well. Um, Leeds Beckett, we once had a meeting which was a walking meeting a few years back. That was my first walking meeting. Actually, it was quite productive. It needed someone on an iPad to take notes, but everyone else is walking. It, can't, it doesn't work if it's too big, but it was four or five of us, I think. It worked really well, and it, we got out and about in green space for an hour, and I think everyone felt much better than sitting in another office space. Um, so there's lots of stuff and tech out there to allow you to do that. Smacks, well, maybe you make it that all meetings walking. Maybe you put the printer in another room far, far away. You know, conversations where you have to walk more or force to make that choice. So have a look at what's the journey of the average person. How often do they make a coffee? Is it next door to them or can we move it further away? Those kind of things that just get someone breaking their sitting. Gamification is key. Whatever you do, make it fun. Because if you don't make it fun, people just don't care. Uh, and particularly the younger working age group where health is less of an emphasis at this point because they're, they're well, it needs to be interesting for, to get people talking. And actually, something like this would do the job. Or Pokemon Go was probably your classic example of that. Uh, is everyone happy with Pokemon Go? Video game where you got to catch Pikachu, but it out in the real world. Um, so you had to walk around catching your, uh, not Tamagotchi, uh, Pokemon. Um, and in order to do that, um, people who were inactive, who were gamers, were suddenly doing lots and lots of miles, which is good if you didn't fall off a cliff or walk into the motorway, which a few people did. Um, but again, it was a really good example of gamification making something fun. The issue, though, is people get bored. So this works today. Six months' time, 
you've seen it too often, you're bored, you then need to refresh. Um, but it's just understanding that people do need constant engagement and how do we do that. Um, but that could just be changing the sign to something quirky every so often in your workplace. It doesn't need to be anything that's overly costly. <coughs> so finally, last couple. So back pain. Um, these are my thoughts around back pain. So you can hopefully see a key theme going through. One is once we screen it and find out, education is key. But obviously basic things on an induction, is there always a posture check and a, and a workstation set up? Is there information given to them about how to break up their working so that they start on the right foot almost and not finding out later after they have a problem? Um, is freestanding desks an option? Some academics love it, others, I think the evidence is mixed. If you're active enough outside the workplace, then there's no extra evidence for free so standing up. However, if you give someone the option to do that, it's still better than nothing, and it's probably more likely to break up their day or have a, a desk that's adjustable. So again, can you put that and make it free? If you're a big enough company, a lot of standing desks will give it to you for free in exchange for the PR. So you might not even be a big investment to do that. Um, so have a look on what could SMACs be, making things mandatory. Um, I really like this concept, which I saw one company do, which was uh, automatic timeouts. So they come up on your screen and they tell you. So it could either be a nudge or a shove where it tells you, please stand up, and that's it, and you can cancel it and carry on. Or it could be one that literally says, no, you can't use this computer again for another 10, 15 minutes. Um, depending on how big of an issue it is and compliance, all of these things could be put in. And the text there, and it's cheap and free anyway. So it's all simple things that can be done. And again, I think for a company, it's great PR to be shown to be doing these things uh, on top of their business case for just employee health. Okay. So weight, um, we've talked about that a lot, so I'm going to leave weight alone for this one and finish with mental health. So mental health, again, as you can see, a massive cause of lost working days. Um, in terms of mental health, I guess you've got nudges. So again, educating people that it's okay I think there was a big campaign, wasn't it? It was, it's okay to talk, that kind of concept. How do we encourage people to come and talk about it? Could shoves be, uh, or things be giving advice or free counselling, things that incentivise people to come forward because they know it's there and they don't need to fund it? Because unfortunately, if you're into the NHS, you are talking 12, 16 weeks potentially for some services. Um, so actually, as an employer, can you link up with people that can screen these people, pick up the ones that are going to be a problem to you, and then do things like counselling? A smack, really hard to do in mental health because that will probably make it worse if you force someone to do something. But could you screen people's mental health? There are loads of good validated questionnaires out there that you can use um, to help work out if someone is mentally well or not or needs support. Okay. And finally, um, so I don't know what you do about sleep at the workplace. You could give them nap time. It's a possibility. If you work at places like Apple and Google, there are napping pods, aren't there? Um, it's probably a bit out there a little bit still, um, unless your employees are working 100 hours. But I guess, again, do they know that it's important how many hours of sleep? Do they know things like the blue light on the device is going to make it worse and they should stop an hour early? Could we do basic small amount of education every induction? Would that be enough to, to sort the problem? And then finally, smacks. Um, could it just be from an employee's perspective that you make sure they finish on time so they have downtime and can go to sleep and not just be stressed? Uh, so this needs a bit more thought to, to what you're going to do in your own work setting. But hopefully that gives you a, a kind of overview of all the risk factors, and I, and I think that kind of nudges, shoves, smacks as a possible way of doing it. So to summarise, um, I really like nudges, shoves, smacks, so work up a model based on that, work out what you can do, how can you incentivise them, and how can you make things mandatory, particularly if you guys are in charge of your companies or have senior roles, then you can do smacks fairly early on. Um, sometimes it's easier to do that and just get the right stuff in place. And then ultimately, how are you going to screen the people? What are you going to screen them for? And then what are you going to put in place? Because there's no point in knowing that a third of your guys are stressed, but not having anything then to do for it. Okay. And then finally, I guess health and wellness is a key aspect. So, and ultimately, if you do it right, it should be cost effective long term. But it, there is some initial investment that's always required. But it's not as much as you think, because some of this can be done in-house and some of it may need outside additional look at in terms of screening. Thank you very much.